Hi, this is Free Thinking Through the Fourth Turning. My name is Sasha Stone. Donald Trump and the Angels, a nation's empathy put to the test on night four of the RNC. Quote, Courage is not having the strength to go on. It is going on when you don't have the strength. Theodore Roosevelt. In 1912, Teddy Roosevelt was on his way to deliver a speech when he was shot in the chest with an assassin's bullet. James Strock writes, quote, The history of 1912 leaves breadcrumbs if we summon the humility to look. In the moment Roosevelt was, to put it mildly, controversial, seeking a third term as president, he split his political party. Longtime accusations of Caesarism were given new life. Nonetheless, Roosevelt's undoubted courage under fire was acknowledged, including by political adversaries in the closing weeks of a hard-fought campaign. And a plaque that reads, On this spot, October 14, 1912, an attempt was made upon the life of Theodore Roosevelt. Erected by the United Spanish War Veterans County of Milwaukee. Trump was shot in Pennsylvania, but he gave his speech in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, the same city where Roosevelt gave his 112 years ago. Politically, and in a variety of ways, T.R. and Trump are worlds apart. But they have one thing in common. They're the man in the arena. The poorest way to face life is to face it with a sneer. There are many men who feel a kind of twisted pride in cynicism. There are many who confine themselves to criticism of the way others do what they themselves dare not even attempt. There is no more unhealthy being, no man less worthy of respect, than he who either really holds or feigns to hold an attitude of sneering disbelief toward all that is great and lofty, whether in achievement or in that noble effort which, even if it fails, comes to second achievement. It is not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who was actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again, because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end the triumph of high achievement, and who at the worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly. As I watched Twitter watch the last night of the Republican National Convention, I felt something shifting inside of me. I don't know if it was the vulnerability on Trump's face, his sadness after his brush with death, or his courage to give his speech anyway and do it for 90 plus minutes that elevated me beyond our usual politics and forced me to look at who we are. Strzok does much of this in his excellent column on the failed assassination and how ugly things have gotten in the process to bring us to this point. That was only half the story. The other half is how so many gathered around to judge how well Trump did and whether or not this means he will win in a landslide or whether it's now a toss-up. They want Biden's debate and Trump's speech to level the playing field. There's just one problem. They're not the same things, and everyone knows it. Trump was polling ahead of Biden even before the debate. He's still polling ahead 
because there is no fixing what the Democrats have done to this country. For now, Trump has the wind at his back, whether or not he gave a great speech. Here is Megyn Kelly with her guest, Kamel Foster. And also astonishingly to see, astonishing to see how well Trump did uh, at the RNC. I mean, the speech was long, um, but I didn't get the sense, despite the fact that there is kind of reporting that suggests as much, that people were bored in the room. The fact that he sold this deeply personal and humanizing story, that, that entire thing contrasts so sharply with the caricature of Donald Trump by his opponents as some sort of self-absorbed hater. He spent an, an inordinate amount of time, really, talking about these other people who had been hurt um, and the, the families that were suffering and the efforts that were being made to try to raise money for them. And if you just suspend whatever sense you have of Trump, the character, and just think about a man named Donald who nearly died, who ne- he came, mo- I mean, millimeters away from being murdered, um, that that changes a person. Um, and he didn't seem rattled. He seemed kind of in control of himself. And I think it's important to just set politics aside for a little bit and kind of look at things in, in that kind of uh, as objective a way as possible and say, I mean, yeah, this is a guy who seems very comfortable in his skin um, and a party that seems unified behind him. And this is, I think the phrase that came to mind thinking about this was kind of total victory. No one was expecting him to come out there like Oprah and start talking about healing our souls and trying to find a way to, you know, no, that's not Trump. He is a fighter. That's why he had the fist up. But to ignore that there was a different side to him that he showed last night is to ignore reality. He's still Trump, but he's so this whole convention showed us a softer side of him that was interesting. So, I mean, the Democrats are going to do what they're going to do, but to try to say he's more divisive than ever because he wants to deport the illegals, which he's been saying forever, or because he called Nancy a name, which I think was the only name that he dropped last night, is dishonest. Roosevelt lost in 1912, but was going for his third term after all. He handed the presidency to Woodrow Wilson, who would ultimately become a Biden-like disaster for the Democrats. Given that, Republicans should not take anything for granted in November. They should not rely on the polls or be complacent. However they plan to drag old Joe over the finish line, they must do it without Mark Zuckerberg. I've done some stuff personally in the past. I'm not planning on doing that this time. Um, and that includes you know, not endorsing either of the candidates. Um, now look, I mean, there's obviously a lot of crazy stuff going on in the world. I mean, the historic events over the last, like over the weekend. And I mean, on a personal note, it's, you know, I mean, seeing Donald Trump get get up after getting shot in the face and pump his fist in the air with the American flag is one of the most badass things I've ever seen in my life. But, um, but, but look, I mean, it's, um, you know, as, and I think, look, it's, at some level as an American, it's like hard to not get kind of emotional about that spirit um, and that fight. And I think that that's why a lot of people like the guy. That is where we've arrived now in this most extraordinary year in American history, where a man can be shot and by the grace of God, turn his head a few inches and miss being among the short list of politicians who have met their fate with an assassin's bullet. Let me begin this evening by expressing my gratitude to the American people for your outpouring of love and support following the assassination attempt at my rally on Saturday. As you already know, the assassin's bullet came within a quarter of an inch of taking my life. So many people have asked me what happened. Tell us what happened, please. And therefore, I will tell you exactly what happened. And you'll never hear it from me a second time because it's actually too painful to tell. It was a warm, beautiful day in the early evening in Butler Township in the great Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. Music was loudly playing and the campaign was doing really well. I went to the stage and the crowd was cheering wildly. Everybody was happy. I began speaking very strongly, powerfully, and 
happily <laughs> because I was discussing the great job my administration did on immigration at the southern border. We were very proud of it. <laughs> Behind me and to the right was a large screen that was displaying a chart of border crossings under my leadership. The numbers were absolutely amazing. In order to see the chart, I started to, like this, turn to my right and was ready to begin a little bit further turn, which I'm very lucky I didn't do, when I heard a loud whizzing sound and felt something hit me really, really hard on my right ear. I said to myself, wow, what was that? It can only be a bullet. And moved my right hand to my ear, brought it down. My hand was covered with blood, just absolutely blood all over the place. I immediately knew it was very serious that we were under attack and in one movement proceeded to drop to the ground. Bullets were continuing to fly as very brave Secret Service agents rushed to the stage, and they really did, they rushed to the stage. These are great people at great risk, I will tell you, and pounced on top of me so that I would be protected. There was blood pouring everywhere, and yet, in a certain way, I felt very safe because I had God on my side. I felt that. I watched Trump's speech holding my breath because I knew the cold, vicious eye of the left and their propaganda press was upon him, waiting to see him fail, waiting for that moment when they could call the night a win for themselves. But like most witnesses to history, the importance of the moment sailed right over their heads. Leave it to Walter Kern to describe it best. Our politics is not what it was, okay? America and, and, and Trump's people, and the Democrats too, feel, they keep using the word existential. They feel they're in some situation, a chaotic and ominous situation that is sort of beyond normal politics. To expect him to go out there and do some sing-song, you know, fake preacherly speech, I think was completely wrong. People I saw on television felt like the guy was just sort of in a rambling, not wanting to go home way, talking. You know, he was off script probably as much as he was on it or more. Yeah. He's like to me, as a to me as a writer, as a as a creator of human situations on the page, I was like, this is a guy who doesn't want to go down and lay on lay down in the dark alone again. He's with a crowd. He's he's kind of not on our time schedule anymore. I mean, he's on dream time. He's on post assassination time. He's looking out mesmerized into a crowd of people and going and his subconscious is going a bullet's coming and his conscious is going. No, that was Saturday. And so I, I, I feel that. These these metrics about what he needs to do and did he do it are all wrong. I, I, I just think they're all wrong. Everybody can say it was a rambling speech, and it was. Everybody can say that it was, you know, too long, and it was given 1976 standards for politics or 1984 standards. But I don't know what 2024 standards for anything are. And, you know, one of the comments I saw repeatedly last night, which was sort of interesting, was, wow, it's 1130 and Joe Biden's been in bed for four hours. You know, um, 
I don't know if that was cope, what they you know call cope on the part of Republicans, but it was kind of interesting that like young young people were like, I gotta hit the sack. And uh the 80 year old was I got another story to tell, kids, you know. Right, right, yep, yeah. Roosevelt's speech was just a little bit shorter than Trump's by just 10 seconds, 82 minutes to Trump's 92. He was urged not to speak so long to give a shorter speech because of the wound in his chest. But he said his manuscript was so thick it likely saved his life, so why not read it all? Theodore Roosevelt, the 26th president of the United States, served his terms from 1901 to 1909, but didn't feel like two terms was enough for old Teddy. Roosevelt would run again in 1912, this time on the third-party Bull Moose ticket. Unfortunately for Teddy, during one of his campaign stops in the Midwest, someone had a different plan. A lone gunman would attempt to assassinate old Teddy Bear. Today, we're looking at when Teddy Roosevelt was shot and still gave an 84-minute speech. Trump, too, should have been given as much time as he wanted to say everything he wanted to say. Was it slick and performative like the usual political candidate? No. Would they have credited him even if it had been? No. The story goes only one way. They prop themselves up as morally superior, requiring Trump to fail. I know his grandchild was up on the thing and they're trying to humanize him and change your idea about who this guy is. Don't fall for that. Trump, you're talking about yeah. Yeah. A gathering of angels. For the left, the appearance of Tucker Carlson, Kid Rock, Hulk Hogan, and Eric Trump was like an array of earthly delights. They could mock any of them. They would write sanctimonious, agonizing columns that get everything wrong. They know that to take down Trump, they have to take down one of the angels looking out for him, and Tucker Carlson is the most delicious of those. Carlson brought the house down with his speech, but please take note. None of that mattered. They would find the loose thread somewhere and pull as hard as they could to turn what had been a successful night into a disaster. For podcast listeners, a headline from Vanity Fair, Tucker Carlson portrays Donald Trump of all people as trying to return democracy to the United States. Tucker spoke about Trump being a leader, especially in a time of crisis. I watched, I watched the video of what happened in Butler, Pennsylvania, about 15, 50 times. I think I was one of about 8 billion people around the world who watched it. And the more I watched it, the more it struck me that everything was different after that moment. Everything. And this convention is different. The nation is different. The world is different. Donald Trump is different. When he stood up after being shot in the face, bloodied, and put his hand up, I thought at that moment, that was a transformation. This was no longer a man well, I think that. I think it was divine intervention. But the effect that it had on Donald Trump, he was no longer just a political party's nominee or a former president or a future president. This was the leader of a nation. And, and I, think there's a, I think there's a difference. I think, I mean, I'm, I've spent most of my life in Washington where the, you know, the president is the, at the top of the pyramid, everyone wants to be the president. But if you think about it, the presidency comes with great power, obviously. But if you think about it, that is a title that is bestowed by a process of some sort that can be subverted. And in the end, it does not confer by itself, as no title does, legitimacy. Just because you call yourself the president doesn't mean that much inherently. I can call my dog the CEO of Hewlett Packard. It doesn't mean she is. You know, it's, it's true. And you hate to say it, but it is also true as a fact that you could take, I don't know, a mannequin, a dead person, and make him president. If you... No, you could. You could. I'm just saying theoretically possible. With enough... <laughs> with enough cheating, that could happen. But being a leader is very different. It's not a title. It's organic. You can't name someone a leader. A leader is the bravest man. 
That's who the leader is. That is true in all human organizations. This is a law of nature. And in that moment, Donald Trump, months before the presidential election, became the leader of this nation. That was the most obvious to me. And I have to say, you know, I, I, I think it changed him. I, I you know, he reached out to Trump within hours of it that night. And what he said to me that night, having just been shot in the face, he said not a single word about himself. He said only how amazed he was and how proud he was of the crowd, which didn't run. And I thought two things. The first thing I thought was, well, of course they didn't run. His courage gave them heart. A leader's courage gives courage to his people. And the second thing I thought was, this is the selfish guy I've been hearing about for nine years, really? Not a word about himself? About his people, period. And the second thing I noticed, which I don't think anyone has remarked upon in public, but I'm just going to since I don't have a script, like, why not? <laughs> is that... He turned down the most obvious opportunity in politics to inflame the nation after being shot. To inflame the nation, which is an opportunity that almost every other politician I've ever met, and certainly his opponents, would have taken instantly. And they would have said, well, what is this? How did he get shot? Like, how did this happen? And those are real questions that we have to get to the bottom of. But in the moments, the days, the week after the shooting, he did not say that. He did his best to bring the country together, and I thought, this is the divisive figure, this is the irresponsible person? No. This is the most responsible, unifying behavior of a leader I think I've ever seen. He talked about real courage, something we don't see much of anymore, because the people who tell us those stories only see courage in people who matter to them, people who are weak and marginalized, not people who are strong and forthright. Another angel of Trump's for years now is Dana White, a true friend if there ever was one. Later, Trump told a story about White being on vacation with his wife and how it would be difficult to show up. But that's what angels do. They show up when you need them the most. I know President Trump is a fighter. I've been saying this since 2015. Now look at what's happened over the last 10 years. We have all seen it with our own eyes. I'm in the tough guy business. And this man is the toughest, most resilient human being that I've ever met in my life. The higher the stakes, the harder he fights. And this guy never, ever gives up. So what's at stake here? The answer is in President Trump's uh, text. And I quote, a fight for our country. I know why he's running for president again. Why else? Would he put himself through everything he's dealt with just to get back here? We all know he doesn't need this. This guy's got a great life. He has a beautiful family. And he has achieved everything that you could possibly achieve in life. I know President Trump is literally putting his life on the line for something bigger than himself. And he's willing to risk it all because he loves this country. Kid Rock and Hulk Hogan bring the bombast. But they're angels to Trump, too. Kid Rock's message after the failed assassination attempt show how angry he was. You f*** with Trump, you f*** with me. And needless to say, so was Hulk Hogan. But what happened last week when they took a shot at my hero? And they tried to kill the next president of the United States. Enough was enough. And I said, let Trumpomania run wild, brother. Let Trumpomania rule again. Let Trumpomania make America great again. These angels are rough and tumble like a protective gang. They remind me of a video I saw that sent the message that if Trump wants protection, he should go to the hood. They'll protect him. Say, President Trump, my president, the United States president, you know who I'm talking to. This can even go to Trump Jr. Hey, if you're going to continue to do these debates, 
in these states or in these little cities and you want some proper protection, this is just a suggestion. This is just my opinion, bro. Because you have a lot of people out there that love you. A lot, right? And it's obvious, obvious that the CIA and all these uh, alphabet agencies don't like you. They don't want nothing to do with you. They don't want to protect you. They don't want nothing. So here's my suggestion to you, Mr. Trump, Mr. President, even Trump Jr., if you get this to your father, huh? Go to the hood. Go get you about 30 to 40, maybe 50 of them ghetto-ass motherfuckers. Excuse my French. I don't care if they white, black, right? And on the day before... You give them mugs a particular color to wear to protect you. I promise you, that won't ever happen again. Another angel was Melania Trump, who seemed to magically appear. It's still hard to believe that she never graced the cover of any fashion magazines during Trump's term. Yes, that's how petty they are on the left. Melania showed up first on stage to greet Trump. She startled him slightly. But then they exchanged kisses before the rest of the family formed a protective circle around him. His success as a patriarch, business owner, and leader will make him a great president for the second time. Most of all, though, Trump is blessed with his army of angels in red hats who know him. They know he often shows humility and vulnerability. They know what he says at his rallies. They hear the same jokes over and over again and laugh every time because they can still laugh and because they still have a sense of humor. They chant for him, they celebrate with him. No one outside of MAGA understands that this is not a movement based on hate, it's a movement based on love. Trump knew when he took the stage that he had to put on a show and he did. It was as wild, funny and brash as a gold-plated skyscraper emblazoned with the word Trump on it. But he also knew he wanted to talk to his supporters and tell them the story of what happened, a story they needed to hear. The amazing thing is that prior to the shot, if I had not moved my head at that very last instant, the assassin's bullet would have perfectly hit its mark, and I would not be here tonight. We would not be together. The most incredible aspect of what took place on that terrible evening in the fading sun was actually seen later. In almost all cases, as you probably know, and when even a single bullet is fired, just a single bullet, and we had many bullets that were being fired, crowds run for the exits or stampede, but not in this case. It was very unusual. This massive crowd of tens of thousands of people stood by and didn't move an inch. In fact, many of them bravely but automatically stood up looking for where the sniper would be. They knew immediately it was a sniper. And then began pointing at him. You can see that if you look at the group behind me. That was just a small group compared to what was in front. Nobody ran and by not stampeding. Many lives were saved. But that isn't the reason that they didn't move. The reason is that they knew I was in very serious trouble. They saw it. They saw me go down. They saw the blood and thought, actually most did, that I was dead. They knew it was a shot to the head. They saw the blood. And there's an interesting statistic. The ears are the bloodiest part. If something happens with the ears, they bleed more than any other part of the body. For whatever reason, the doctors told me that. I said, why is there so much blood? He said, it's the ears. They bleed more. So we learned something, but they just... And when he told them that he's not supposed to be there, they chanted back words of encouragement. Yes, you are. And then it all stopped. Our Secret Service sniper from a much greater distance and with only 
one bullet used took the assassin's life, took him out. I'm not supposed to be here tonight. Not supposed to be here. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm not. And I'll tell you, I stand before you in this arena only by the grace of Almighty God. It mattered to Trump that he let them know how grateful he was that they didn't run. That is, he said, what motivated him to raise his fist in solidarity with them and send the message that this was not over yet. What we just saw Trump do is something no other politician has ever done or will do in our lifetimes. It wasn't easy. He must have thought he saw shadows everywhere. His body and nervous system were likely on high alert. Watching him speak brought home, at least to me, how important this man's survival has become to so many of us. It was as though invisible threads were holding him up, and there was nothing but choppy, shark-infested waters below him. Hang on, Trump, I kept saying to myself. Look at everything you've gone through so far. Look at what you've survived. No one else could handle even one of those things, let alone all of them. I have been watching Trump long enough to know that something finally did get to him, and that something was a surprise attack on his life. Here is Walter Kern. I mean, everyone's expecting this guy to have recovered in a matter of days from an assassination attempt doing exactly what you have to do all the time during a campaign. He's supposed to get through that. And I'm going to tell you what, I've studied trauma before. You know what's traumatizing to Trump? Even worse than the fact that he almost died, it's that somebody else right next to him did die. If you know veterans, that's the thing they cannot get over that somebody else died and they didn't do all they could or someone died who should have been them that you know that's upsetting and i, I and i know to others it's anathema to humanize this guy because we've been told not to and we've been told politics is this cold game of winning and losing but i'm going to i'm going to be different than the rest of them in all the new york times it's not going to matter the thing about going to conventions is you think every hour, every three hours, every night is the most important night of all time. And they think that one long speech that was rather like any Trump speech, except more subdued, derailed everything. This is their this is the wish casting of the Dems and the panic of nervous Republicans. Not going to matter a bit. But even still, even with that kind of trauma, Trump stood there and he finished his speech. He did it to hold his movement together and to give them hope. He did it for his country. He did it because he believes in moving forward. He did it because he knows, at least right now, no one can replace him. If I give you one message to hold in your hearts today, it's this. Treat the word impossible as nothing more than motivation. Relish the opportunity to be an outsider because it's the outsiders who change the world and who make a real and lasting difference. The more that a broken system tells you that you're wrong, the more certain you should be that you must keep pushing ahead. You must keep pushing forward. What the MAGA movement is, how it's been embraced by the GOP, has united all of us outsiders under one big tent to say, no, we do not like what has happened to our country. And we want to fight, fight, fight for change. If they think this was somehow a diminished Trump or 
Now Biden would come roaring back like a lion with Superman at the bottom of the pool? Think again. Trump will be holding one rally after another heading into Election Day. He knows he's come too far to turn back now. I am reminded of this quote by Teddy Roosevelt. In any moment of decision, the best thing you can do is the right thing. The next best thing is the wrong thing. And the worst you can do is nothing. Thank you for listening to my podcast series on the Republican National Convention. I hope you have a great weekend. And remember, to thine own self, be true. You saw